pediatric traumatic cardiac arrest was a topic that came out of um, me sort of trying to have a bit of a think about the case that probably still scares me the most in this in this job. Um, and you know, by way of disclosure, I'm anything but a subject matter expert on this topic. Um, and as a adult medicine ICU doctor, I can make a fair um, a fair claim for being the least qualified person in the room to actually talk about this. <laughs> um, so I wanted to think around a hypothetical case that still would put me out of my comfort zone and um, uh, scares me as something that we could see on the on the job out there. And I want to have a look at the evidence around that and try and see what the best sort of evidence-based algorithm or approach um, that exists out there to, to apply in that situation. Um, and I guess with the subtext of thinking about if I just did what I would do in an adult TCA, um, how far off the mark would I actually be? So we're going to have a look at a paper that tries to address that question today. Um, there are obviously far more experienced and knowledgeable people in this field in the room. So if everyone has thoughts, interjections, corrections at any point, please, please feel free to, to jump in. Otherwise, we're trying to have a bit of time for discussion um, at the end of things. Um, so as a way of background to traumatic cardiac arrest in a pediatric population, when you start reading around this, the published material on this topic, you quickly realise there isn't um, there isn't actually that much out there. Um, and basically, as every paper on this in about the last 10 years opens, the, the opening line of the paper points out the fact that this is a, um, uh, a high acuity, but thankfully a very low frequency event. Um, it should come back. Yeah. It has not. Hang on. Yeah. Hang on. Yeah. Why have I lost it down here now? Sorry, Carl, Carl, help me. Uh, yeah, what's that doing? Uh, that, that one, that one, it's just... Oh. Tonight, like tonight, still have my presenter view. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, just restart the presentation. Uh, yeah, so, so um, high acuity, but thankfully a low frequency event. Um, it does make it quite difficult to dig out the data around traumatic arrest in children. Um, and when you look back and do it, I did a little bit of a literature review, and there's sort of about one, less than one publication on this per year over about the last 30 years. Um, there are, however, a couple of recent um, epidemiological studies that have come out in the last few years that sort of give a little bit of a uh, lay of the land. Particularly, there's been a couple of studies conducted out of Victoria. Uh, there was a large 2019 retrospective review of Ambulance Victoria data, um, which is probably the most recent and applicable to our, our population um, that I had a bit of a look through. So over a 17-year period there, they had uh, just over 290 uh, traumatic cardiac arrests through the service, um, which gave sort of population incidents, which obviously uh, very low. They had a mean age of seven. They had 80% of them ended up being male. 50% uh, involved a motor vehicle in some way um, with falls and non-accidental injuries sort of making up the next largest categories. Uh, in their data set, they managed to get ROSC at around 22%, uh, just over, just under 19% made it to hospital. Uh, but unfortunately, just over 1% actually survived the discharge. Um, they had no significant difference in outcomes over the course of that 17 year period. Um, and these numbers reflect pretty well other recent publications out of the US and Asia. Um, depending on which publication you go to, the breakdown between blunt penetrating um, TCAs varies slightly, um, but with overall blunt making up the majority, unfortunately penetrating having, um, uh, having better outcomes. Um, <laughs> So trying to find good evidence to guide practice in such a such a rare event is challenging. Um, we're obviously never going to have good high quality RCT levels to guide us. And then you get some interesting research questions about the best 
um, modalities to apply lower levels of evidence when that's all you've really got to, to guide us. Um, which leads on to the paper that we're going to try and look at today. So this is a um, uh, 2018 publication by Vassallo and all out of the UK. Uh, it's quite an interesting pragmatic approach to trying to generate a um, dedicated resuscitation algorithm um, in pediatric TCAs. So they have conducted a form of Delft study, um, which is a methodology that I wasn't particularly familiar with going into this. Um, but it's essentially a method of trying to generate a consensus um, position out of expert opinion, where that's the highest level of evidence you go off to sort of guide yourself in, um, uh, in a particular field. And it finds its place in trying to answer research questions like this, where it's such a rare event that that's going to be all you can get. Uh, in essence, you gather together a group of subject matter experts, and you put to them um, a series of statements on the topic that you're trying to answer, to which they can either agree or disagree. And then with that, you sort of refine your refine your statements that you put into the group um, with the idea that by the end, you should be able to hopefully come up with sort of consensus position that can then be um, worked into practice. So in this particular study, uh, methodologically, they took sample of subject matter experts from across critical care specialties working in major paediatric centres across the UK. Um, they were pretty well represented from um, paediatric ED, ICU, anaesthesia and some pre-hospital representation. Uh, they set out a priority with a 70% consensus um, as a benchmark to sort of include any recommendations in their final, final algorithm. Um, uh, and they based off adult literature, um, established practice guidelines, um, and uh, application of other paediatric data, they sort of generated 19 statements going into this on the management of paediatric TCA that they were going to put to their, um, their expert panel and try and come up with a dedicated or rework into a dedicated algorithm that could be used. Um, and that's, that's a bit heavy to, to actually come across and read up there, but in essence, out of their 19 uh, initial statements through three rounds of revision, they managed to get 13 of them across to consensus amongst the group that they then include. And it's all thankfully fairly familiar stuff of what we do in adult practice. Um, so they agreed that they were going to treat TCA in kids to a standard approach, regardless of age, initial rhythm. They agreed they were going to prioritise addressing reversible factors um, over things like cardioversion and chest compression. Uh, they felt that there was probably still a role for chest compression where hypovolemia or hypoxia were felt to be a large driver um, uh, in the course of the arrest. They were going to perform bilateral thoracostomies um, as part of the drill. They would bind pelvises, splint limbs, and control external hemorrhages. Uh, volume resuscitation would be performed in, um, with warm blood products and there would be consideration of thoracotomy and penetrating TCA. Um, so this is the final, uh, I guess, um, consensus that they, they derived and they were going to try and apply into an algorithm. Um, and coming at this from an adult standpoint, it feels relatively reassuring. This is, this is stuff that we have been um, trained and drilled into us uh, in an adult population that we are applying in a, in a, new, in a new framework. Um, so from that, they, they generated a, a PIDS TCA algorithm. Um, and, you know, side by side to, to what we're used to and what we, we use in our own practice and is well established, you can see there are a lot of similarities. Um, you know, it has an early branching point in traumatic and medical arrests. Uh, and moving down the traumatic arm, they were going to, you know, control hemorrhages, control an airway, ensure adequate oxygenation and ventilation um, early on. There would be bilateral thoracotomies to be performed, um, volume to be placed in the form of blood. Um, and pelvic binder, limbs at length, which all, all feels fairly reassuring um, and familiar to that point. There are, so I guess, where are the differences from the algorithms that we know and have applied in adult practice? Um, and there are a couple of small differences and a nuance, but they're important, and they come back to some of the epidemiological points um, from earlier. So what we know from the work that has been done on pediatric TCAs and survivors, particularly in the blunt TCA group, are overrepresented by children that have sustained a concurrent um, asphyxiation of hypoxic in, insult in their mechanism. So concurrent drownings, chest crush injuries, high cervical cord injuries are all important considerations. 
Um, but also recognition that the rates of concurrent traumatic brain injury is far higher in this group than it is in the adult population. Um, and the impact of the role of impact brain apnea is a really important consideration. Um, and this subset of arrested children um, tend to fare better and it is important to identify and treat early. Um, particularly in the child arresting post-trauma with minimal external injuries or a lower impact mechanism. Um, so forward loaded this into the algorithm with prompts to consider the role of hypoxia, impact apnea and trauma in children. Um, so I think what this boils back to is ensuring good A's and B's from the outset, taking care um, to make sure these are addressed well and early because these are going to be the big ticket items moving through the other life-saving um, interventions. Um, and this, you know, the, the role of impact brain apnea, and particularly in this paediatric subset, is, is appearing more um, in the literature. So coming back to their algorithm, I think, like, I think, I think it's a really pragmatic and um, good effort at generating consensus position where, um, with it, with the resources and data they had. For me, the outstanding questions that came from this and having a, a look around it were generated from the um, the points that either just made it into the present into their final consensus or were just excluded um, by majority. So thoracotomy makes it into the algorithm. Um, so I want to have a look at some of the evidence around this in this age group, um, who we should be considering it on, um, which I'll come back to in a second. The other point is they reprioritize chest compressions um, somewhat in some subsets of um, traumatic arrest. Um, as for the adult algorithm, they sort of deprioritize it until after other life-saving uh, interventions are performed. But they did feel there was a caveat to the role in PEDS TCA, particularly where hypoxia um, was felt to be to be a factor. So whether we should be having a lower threshold for inclusion of um, chest compressions in the PEDS TCA population. Um, I want to have a look at, um, uh, particularly without evidence of external losses or um, and after initial interventions have been performed. Um, with regards to thoracotomy, um, I just had a brief look at the literature around that in this population. Again, it's fairly sparse and there is a little bit of Eden Hospital ED um, publications that we can try and extrapolate to guide us here. Um, so the largest published data set that I could find um, comes from a paper by Allen and all out of the Journal of Ped Surgery in 2015. And they basically did a 20 year retrospective review of ED thoracotomies in a, um, a large Ped trauma center in California. Um, so in that particular subset, they ended up with 250 cases over the course of that 20-year period. Uh, just over 50% were traumatic uh, penetrating arrests, high percentage of males, uh, medium age 15. Um, their survival rate for penetrating, just over 10%, and as expected, very low for the blunt arrest group. Um, and they had no survivors of that period in those less than 14 years, unfortunately. Um, 